Okay, thank you, mercy. Okay, that is not a black hole evaporating. That's the Kizaman volcano in Kamchatka that took a, a picture out of, the, out of the window of an airplane when I was flying from Vancouver to, uh, I can't remember whether it was about a, 10 years ago, I, I, either to Korea or to, or to Japan. Um, oh, I forgot to even look up the year, but it's, on, it's in the Wikipedia article about Kizaman volcano. So, uh, okay, so, <clears throat> Well, Cla we've, we've heard a lot from Jose, and, the, and the, he's covered a lot that some of the things that I'm trying to cover too, so there's some overlap. In some sense, classically, black holes may be the simplest objects in the universe. They, and, and put the, once they settle down, they're just characterized by mass and angular momentum in asymptotically flat space. But quantum mechanically, they may be the most complex. They seem to have an enormous number of states and an <coughs> enormous number of different behaviors. So I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the time scales, so I'll talk a bit about that. There are a number of time scales associated with a black hole. Um, in this talk, yeah, I, I'm uh, going to, whoops, where's the pointer? The pointer's the top bar? Well, oh, there we go. Anyway, for simplicity, I'm gonna just talk about four-dimensional space-time. Maybe most of the formulas generalize to other dimensions, but let's do that. So if you, if you imagine, well, we, the biggest black hole that we've seen now, I mean, it's some question about what the mass is, but of order 40 uh, billion solar masses, at least there's some example in Wikipedia, the number is very questionable. But anyway, of that order, there's others of order 30 billion solar masses black hole. So let's suppose we take a, the biggest one to get some of the biggest numbers of this. Then, of course, if you say that we have that much energy, then what's the quantum oscillation period for the, for the phase to change by 2 pi? Then that, that period is, is about... 10 to the 91 seconds, and then the Hawking decay time uh, is around 10 to the 106 seconds, so there's a ratio of, of those times of that. And then there's also uh, larger time scales of black hole if it's, if it's stable in the microcanonical and in, a, in an anti de Sitter space time. Well, as the box can't be too big, as Jose said, in this case, for this black hole, the box can't be bigger than about 10 to the 31 light years. Then there's a classical recurrence time, or I think what Jose called this Hilbert time, e to the, the s. Uh, it's roughly that. It's roughly the 170th, 37th root of a Googleplex. And then there's a quantum recurrence time for the quantum state to get back to within some small number of that, which is doubly exponential. So it's roughly exponential of 10 to the <clears throat> 10 to the 10 to the 100, and then times alpha. So Googleplex times alpha, raise it to the power of 10, exponentiated. Uh, anyway, so there's enormous range of times for, for, for some of these uh, black holes. And okay, I probably can skip over the details of this, but to avoid historical accidents of units like the foot and, and so on, I'll use Planck units. And here you know the Planck mass and the, and the Planck length and the Planck time and the Planck, and the Planck energy, which is roughly, I think, the, the most kinetic energy of an airplane that I've asked the pilots about afterward what their mass was, about 10 Planck units for the kinetic energy of a jumbo jet. Smaller jets tend to be less than one Planck unit of kinetic energy. Uh, Planck power is that Planck energy density. Well, it's 85% it's of 10 to the 200 electron volts per megaparsec cubed, if you want to use crazy units for this thing. Uh, Okay, and then observe physical parameters and Planck units. Well, the elementary charge, I'm setting H bar and C and G and e, is, is roughly that. Proton mass, uh, <clears throat> about 10 to the minus 20. It's very close to the inverse square root of the largest prime ever found by a human without the use of computers, uh, but off by a little bit. Uh, electron mass, 10 to the minus 23. Solar mass is roughly 10 to the 37. It's, 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 it's close to the inverse square of this uh, <clears throat> by Stellar, stellar model thing. Supermassive black hole, the biggest one I'll take is this, which is roughly that. A year, well, a, a Julian year that astronomers use is that. Age of universe is about five trillion days. Cosmological constant, interesting, it's very, these numbers are very close to uh, unity that fit in there. So you can describe it by, ten, by three English words, 10 square attohertz is the cosmological constant. And the given Hawking energy is also very close to Within the uncertainties of lambda, it's, it's, it's very close to th this, this number. OK, that's just the background. Uh, <clears throat> well, as we heard before, after suggestions from David Beckenstein that black holes have an entropy proportional to their horizon area, which Stephen Hawking originally noted would be inconsistent with the then believed fact that black holes can only absorb radiation, but then after independent <coughs> uh, predictions by Jacob Zeldovich and Alexei Starbinsky, and then others of us, Larry Ford, and I sort of independently realized later 
uh, the, the, the black, rotating black holes would emit. Then Hawking heard about this, and he talked to Stelovich and, and Starovinsky. He liked their idea, didn't like their derivation, so he went back to do it, to do the derivation, and found his way that even non-rotating black holes emit radiation and have a temperature. And so here I'll give it for a, a non-rotating uncharged black hole, in other words, short shield black hole, uh, with the event horizon radius that. So, well, for a general uh, black hole, it's in, in, in four dimensions. It's, it's uh, related to the, the surface gravity. Uh, <clears throat> and then, okay, if you put in the numbers, it's one, and Planck unit is one over eight pi m. So this thermal Hawking radiation made Bekenstein's idea of entropy consistent. It wouldn't just be infinite entropy if the black hole only absorbed. And it fixed the unknown constant of proportionality so that the dimensionless entropy, entropy divided by Boltzmann's constant, uh, <clears throat> is, is then given by, in Planck units, a quarter of the horizon area. Or for a short shield black hole, 4 pi m squared. So we heard in the last talk, the entropy goes proportional to the square of the, uh, <clears throat> of the, of the mass, of the energy. Uh, <clears throat> so then, let's see, I have this. Uh, okay, so then evaporation rates. Uh, I did numerical calculations from Hawking's formulas of, of various <clears throat> rates for a black hole. And roughly, if you have a big black hole of, of, of stellar masses and assuming that all three neutrinos uh, have masses that are within an order of magnitude or a couple of them, then, then these massive black holes basically can only emit photons and gravitons. And then the, the mass rate loss is given by this. This is not the fine structure constant, but just the numerical calculation constant that I calculated. Then the, the entropy, uh, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole decreases by that. The radiation, because it goes through this barrier, there's, there's some extra entropy denoted. It's bigger by a factor that for photons and gravitons is about this. The last digits are probably uncertain, but I put them here as just, if anybody wants to repeat the calculation, I'd be curious to know how close I got it. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, if it's way off, I don't know. Do I lose my PhD? If the, if, it was, if somebody gets finally different numbers. Okay, so semi-classical evolution of the black hole, it's, it's decaying in four dimensions, and because, well, we heard from the last talk, the, the lifetime goes as m cubed, and so therefore the, the, the mass as a function of time goes like this. The decay time is that, it's, it, it, it put in the numbers, it's, it's almost 9,000 times the, in Planck units times the cube of the mass, or in solar masses, this is the mass of the sun, 10 to the 67 years for a solar mass, and a 10 solar mass would be 10 to the 70 years, and so on. And then the semi-classical Bekenstein-Hawking black hole entropy then has this time dependence, and whereas the radiation entropy, because there is this extra factor of beta because of the scattering through the barrier outside, has this sort of form. Then, <coughs> okay, if, Hawking, well, as we heard also from the previous talk, assuming local quantum field theory and a fixed dynamical space-time background, and particularly assuming the horizon's smooth, well, I guess this is really what's outside. Right? I suppose it doesn't really matter what's inside the horizon, but if what's outside the horizon is smooth, assuming local quantum field theory, then <clears throat> it, with an evaporating black hole with its absolute event horizon, that's the boundary of what can get to the outside, then leads to loss of information. Uh, from the exterior. Hawking therefore predicted when the black hole evaporates away, in information would be lost from the universe and a pure initial state would become a mixed state. So he did this breakdown of, uh, I think he originally titled a breakdown of physics and a, a referee required him to change that, so he break, re, break down of predictability. And this argument did depend on a semi-classical analysis. The first paper to dispute it was the following one, which gave a number of options, but it didn't really prove which one was right, but suggested that maybe there was no loss of information. Well, the, the issue lay in the doldrum for, for years, but now most opinion, but not all, has switched the mind, and even Hawking has, has conceded that. But there are still, you know, holdouts like Bill Unruh and Bob Wald and so on think that maybe information really is lost. Now, interest in this, in this black hole information thing uh, <laughs> surged recently with a paper by Elmhiri, Maroff, Polchinski, and Sully, Black hole complementary or firewalls in 2013. So they gave a provocative argument that suggests that an infalling <clears throat> observer burns up at the horizon or it gets destroyed at the horizon of a sufficiently old black hole. So the horizon becomes what they call the firewall. So <clears throat> the argument basically was that if unitary evolution suggests that at late times the Hawking radiation is maximally entangled with the remaining black hole and neighborhood, including the modes just outside the horizon, 
But then this further suggests that what's just outside cannot be sufficiently entangled with what's inside. There's a monogamy theorem that's, that something can't be maximally entangled with two different things. So if, if the Hawking radiation that's about to come out is maximally entangled with the earlier thing, well, you'd expect it to be at least after it came out, you'd expect it to be maximally entangled with the, the, the earlier Hawking radiation. If it is also maximally entangled when it's just about to come out, it can't be maximally entangled with just inside. And then without this entanglement, you'd have fields basically oscillating into, or fluctuating independently on both sides of the horizon, which would lead to huge gradients in the fields and therefore large energy densities. So without this latter entanglement, observer falling into the black hole should be burned up by high energy radiation. Okay, I'm not gonna solve this, this, this problem here. I think, I mean, it does make assumptions in particular local quantum field theory outside the horizon, whereas in quantum gravity, I don't think we have locality. So it's, there's at least one assumption that's almost certainly not true, but it is a little bit surprising how uh, locality is a pretty good approximation. Uh, now, you cannot externally observe entanglement across the horizon, because, at least if it is an absolute horizon, because you can't see across it. But, it's, but this should be eventually transferred to the radiation. So one thing we'd like to know is the retarded time dependence of the von Neumann entropy, the Hawking radiation. If you look at, at Scry plus at the future null infinity and ask what's the entropy of up to what, some point, how does it depend on time? And the astrometer raised this question, gave five candidate answer. Maybe it's a bad question. Maybe the information is destroyed. Maybe there's a long ring remnant. Maybe there's a non-local remnant and then max or maximal information return. Well, I'm going to assume unitarity and maximal information return, that the black hole does go away, it doesn't leave a remnant, and that this, th this comes out. So let me just give a little bit things about the, uh, the time scales. So I'll assume unitary evolution, no loss of information. I'll assume that there's an initial approximately pure state. So for example, if you form it from a star, the entropy of a star is of order that, which is a lot bigger than the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of the black hole for a solar mass is of order 20 of orders of magnitude bigger. And you remember, this gets exponentiated. So the number of states is just enormously bigger uh, for a black hole than for the star. So, but we assume that since it's formed maybe from a low entropy state, that initially the black hole really the number of states that are composed of is much smaller than this. It's actually a, a tiny subset of that. Okay, I'll assume that there's nearly maximal entanglement between the hole and the radiation. That, <coughs> and, and also, uh, Thibault asked me to <coughs> ask, how do I measure entropy? I'm going to measure entanglement across a fuzzy boundary. If you put a sharp boundary, you tend to get, depending on what your cutoff is, if your cutoff's of order the Planck energy, you tend to get uh, en entropies that have ordered the uh, quarter of the area, and I want to avoid that. So, well, one thing is you could take as the if it's a pure if the whole thing's a pure state, then <coughs> half the mutual information would be the entropy of each part. So instead of taking with a sharp bounder, you could say one of the systems inside R equals three m, where's the circular photon orbits. I mean, it, this is arbitrary, but and the other one's outside R equals 6 in, which is the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbits for massive things. So if you admit that region in between, then the, the mutual information becomes finite. You're sort of missing that region, but you'd expect just Hawking radiation without, it, without including the high energy modes to have, you know, over border one particle crossing this region at each time. Okay, I'm assuming complete evaporation in the just final Hawking radiation. Uh, I'm assuming a non-rotating uncharged, in other words, short field black hole in four dimensions. Initial black hole is large, massless photons and gravitons. If, if this is true, then, then I'm assuming that there's no other particles that have less mass than this. And this is quite a lot less than the differences in the, in the masses for neutrinos. We don't know what the lightest neutrino, but I'm just assuming the lightest one's bigger than that. So I'm going to assume just essentially photons and gravitons emitted. That's basically just to get the time scales. I mean, you can modify it to that. Okay, I just made up another slide this morning just to explain a little bit more uh, or another idea of how to regularize this thing. So suppose I said that there is a von Neumann entropy in a region. Let's suppose we take spherical shells and suppose we say that it's a region between R ti A times M, that's so I can make A to be just a pure number, and R of B times M. So for example, I'll use A equals three and B equals six, for example. And suppose you use the Planck scale cutoff <coughs> with areas of that. <coughs> And let's suppose that I want the, I really want the entropy, not counting these contributions that have ordered the area, or if you, if you do the cutoff just right, you could get it A over four of the boundaries. 
So I'm, I really am interested in, in the entropy of taking off these high values that you get at the cutoffs. So suppose I did that. Well, let's suppose I have a Cauchy surface that maybe cuts across and goes into the black hole, but it's, it's, it's regular. It's a Cauchy surface, and I want to, and, and so on the whole Cauchy surface I have some state, but then I want to divide it into subsystems. So say one that goes all the way from the, the middle. I mean, I have to have the surface go back and before the singularity, so it's a, it's a regular Cauchy surface. So from zero radius to 3m, and then between 3m and 6m, and then from 6m on to infinity. And suppose that except for the high frequency mode, there's negligible entanglement between this region. I mean, after all, it's sort of, it's a small region, so there wouldn't be expected to be many Hawking quarticles quassing it. So except for the high energy modes, you wouldn't expect that much entanglement between this region and the other two regions. So therefore, the, 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 this, this, uh, Finite entropy, or this entropy is not too big, but it would be <coughs> between there and there and between there and there. In other words, there's not too much entanglement, so it's basically a sum. And also from r equals 3m out to infinity is roughly this. Okay, then you can just, by putting this in, you, I can write these things in terms of these unregularized, well, you have to get a cutoff, I guess, to make them finite. But these ones that you count, that you'd look, you include the high energy modes, if you did that, you could, you could, you could get, this, and then that's an approximation for that, and then this is approximation for that. So if I use those approximations, I get finite numbers because basically there's one boundary here and one boundary for there, and but this has two boundaries, so therefore the minus sign, the, the contribution from the boundaries that are, that are like A over four cancel between here and here, and similarly down here. So these are then finite things, so that's what I'm gonna be sort of talking about uh, when I talk about these, these things. Uh, <clears throat> now, the arguments for nearly maximal entanglement <coughs> is that if you take a if you take a, a sub a, a pure state a system in a pure state and it's a the the Hilbert space is a tensor product of two parts, then if you trace over one part you get the the von Neumann entropy of the other part, and similarly if you trace over this part you get the von Neumann entropy of that. If the whole thing's a pure state, those two are the same. But then you could ask that, of course, that depends, I mean, once you set the decomposition of the Hilbert space, it depends on what the total pure state is. But you can take the average, it, you, if you integrate over this, over, over this, this complex projective space that Gary talked about uh, with the, uh, the, the, the standard measure on it, the, the, Fubini, uh, the, the volume element of the Fubini study metric on that, you get what's called the Haar measure on these pure states. So I can do a Haar averaging over all pure states to calculate what the average was. And that's what I, what I calculated <clears throat> in here. I had an approximate formula and I had a conjecture for an exact formula that other people later proved. And then if you apply, that, that comes out that there's less than the half unit of information on average in the smaller subsystem. In other words, it's entropy, it's von Neumann entropy. The average is within a half a unit of the, and actually, if the, if the two systems are unequal in size, it's much closer. But that's sort of the maximum difference. Then I applied this to black holes. If all the information going into gravitational collapse es escapes gradually from the black hole, it would likely come out at such a slow rate or be so spread out it can never be found or excluded by perturbative analysis. This is like Jose was saying. It's, you've got e to the minus s effects, so it's non-perturbative. You can't, you can't exclude it by perturbative analysis. Well, then also uh, Sakino and Susskind uh, conjecture that black holes are fa fast scramblers and that they take a time of logarithmic in the number of degrees of freedom <coughs> and that black holes are the fastest scramblers in nature. So that they rapidly give a state that gives something like this. They don't, well, it doesn't give Haar averaging over this time, but it gives it so that almost all subsystems, the, the, a the average entropy would be very nearly the same as that. So they support my results on using an average overall pure state, so the total system of black hole plus radiation. So, <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's just do some calculations. Suppose we take this, these semi-class, these are now really going to be the, the, the ones that have taken out the, 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 the A things at the boundaries. I'm going back to capital letters here. Uh, <clears throat> suppose they be, a, uh, all right, suppose these are approximate upper bounds on the von Neumann entropy. See, I'm thinking the Beckenstein-Hawking entropy is it's not always the actual von Neumann entropy of a black hole. In fact, a black hole that formed from a star, the actual von Neumann entropy uh, would be much, much less, but that would be the maximum for a, a black hole of that size. And then the radiation will assume that, you know, you have some volume and, and you have this, um, this amount of energy to radiate. What's the maximum amount of that? So that's what these two numbers are. The von Neumann entropy 
of the Hawking radiation, which is assumed the initially pure initial state of unitarity, is the same as the von Neumann should be the black hole since the combination is in a pure state, and it shouldn't be greater than either this or these. These are upper bounds. So then, <coughs> okay, I can make this. Well, this is probably coming up on an acronym that's the first letters of my wife's name, Kathy. But anyway, conjectured anex or anorexic triangle hypothesis that the triangular inequalities for, for the, the joint entropy are, are, are nearly saturated. So it's a nearly, a nearly anorexic. Well, actually, it was my wife. I told her it was a very skinny triangle, and she asked me if it was anorexic. So anyway, she gave me the idea. It's an anorexic triangle, but the, the inequalities are very nearly saturated. So this leads to the assumption of nearly maximal entanglement between hole and radiation. So the von Neumann interest should be, be near the minimum of that. It can't be bigger than either one. And as time changes, then these, well, first this is big, and then the radiation is small, and then as the radiation come out, they cross. So <clears throat> that's what then leads to this, the von Neumann entropy going up and down. So it's the semi-classical entropy is monotonically increasing with time of the radiation and the semi-classical entropy of the black hole is decreasing as the black hole evaporates. The maximum occurs at this crossover point at this time, uh, <clears throat> which you see it's about half the decay time, but it's not exactly. And the, the epsilon depends on this ratio of, the, of the, uh, <clears throat> how much entropy is produced by the thing. And the mass of the black hole, it's about 77% of the initial black hole. And the, the Becking Hawking the Bekenstein Hawking entropy is about 60% of the, of the initial value. It's a little bit off, uh, off from uh, the half, which is, you know, but this is, yeah, this is the point at which the thing uh, <coughs> turns over. So at this time, the von Neumann entropy of the radiation, and that the entropy then has a value of that, about 60% of the initial one, or in terms of solar masses, it's about 6 times 10 to the 76 times the square of the mass in solar units. So it's about 20% greater than half the original semi-classical one. And this time, it's about 83% of the, of the ha half of the K, uh, sorry, it's about, it, it, it's, 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 it's roughly, it's that times this time, which is the time for the black hole to lose half its area and half its semi-classical Bekenstein <laughs> Hawking entropy. So, <clears throat> Okay, then you can put in, if you want to, you can then get an explicit formula for the von Neumann entropy because uh, <clears throat> you've got th this at the early times before this T star. You, you've got this, this theta functions once, you've got this term, and then after that time you have this term, and then putting in numbers in, ter in Planck units you get this, this sort of thing. So here's a, here's a graph of that thing. You can see it goes up. And it curves up a little bit because, of course, as the black hole loses mass, it evaporates faster. And then here it goes down, and then it curves, it bends down because basically, as you get to the end, the black hole evaporates faster. So that's it's the, the, this is even more <coughs> more curved for for this this thing. So okay, that's what you that's what we sort of expect. I mean, it's not proved that this is exactly right, but that's that's what I would sort of expect it to be. Well, I'd also expect some correct some corrections to those formulas from fluctuations of the mass. The black hole could spit out a little more particles or a little less. So there may be of order, uh, changes in the order of the mass. Fluctuations of the position. There's going to be Brownian motion of the black hole. And in fact, by the time a solar mass black hole evaporates, the uncertainty in the position is going to be, I forget, 20 orders of magnitude than the, than the size of the observable universe today or something. And it's enormous how much uncertainty there is in the position. But that doesn't add that much to the entropy. Uh, entropy of the motion, okay, there's a log m, and maybe non-maximal entanglement, the fact that it's, it's not going to be exactly to peak, there's this half units of order one, and entropy near the black hole, I'm not counting the high frequency modes, but just caulking particles near the order one, fuzziness in the boundary of order one, so there's, you know, there's, there's corrections of order, but the whole entropy is of order m squared, so these are all relatively small corrections. So, <clears throat> okay, so on the assumption that a Schwarzschild black hole of initial mass, much bigger than the solar mass, basically to make it too massive to emit anything but photons and gravitons, if it starts at a nearly pure quantum state, at least relatively speaking, and decays away completely by a unitary process while being nearly maximal scrambled at all time, the von Neumann entropy increases up to this maximum entropy at a time given by this, and then decreases back to near zero. Uh, okay, I don't have time to give it here, but if you did start with a black hole in a maximally mixed state, 
Uh, this is fr from some other paper where I talked about the time dependence. The von Neumann entropy of the Hawking radiation increases from zero up to a maximum of a bit, of about 20% more than the initial uh, Bekelstein Hawking entropy at this time, and then it increases back to this. So you can do these curves for different values of initial, initial entropy, but here I don't have I t only time I just, uh, just to summarize what I've calculated in some other paper. Now, so far I've been talking about black holes that decay in asymptotically flat space-time, but in anti desitter <coughs> space-time with a negative cosmological constant, if you impose either thermal or reflecting boundary conditions that it's time-like conformal boundary at radial infinity, the thing, it acts like a finite box, so either you keep it perfectly reflecting and fix the energy, or you keep it thermal at the box, then sufficiently large black holes can be stable in either the canonical or microcanonical ensemble, as Hawking and I found. So if we use this notation for the, where, so B is, is what Jose called L, it's the scale length of the black hole, and a canonical ensemble gives a stable black hole if the temperature is bigger than the square root of 3 over 2 pi b. This is in uh, four-dimensional space-time. These generalized, you can generalize to other dimensions. And the mass is bigger than that. So if, if the scale is, is b divided by giga years, then, then, the, the, then the mass would, would have to be bigger than, than this. If that were a giga year of course, uh, <coughs> for, for the canonical ensemble, and B is related to the negative cosmological constant by this formula. The microcanonical ensemble allows the box to be much bigger than the black hole, and then basically the, the energy of the hole plus radiation has to be bigger than this. Well, this comes out from numbers and then the, the root of some cubic. Uh, <clears throat> so it's about this, this mass where B is in giga years. So if, if we had a link scale of giga years, then you'd have. Um, then even a, a black hole smaller than a solar mass could be stable with radiation. So you could have, you know, so, solar mass or less, it's stable with its radiation in this, in this anti desitter space if its size is, is at least that or bigger. Uh, <clears throat> okay, then we have various recurrence times. If you have it in anti desitter space to keep the thing from evaporate, then the, the black hole can, can, can change and you can. If, the, if Rh is the radius of the horizon in anti desitter space, then the mass and the entropy are this, the, the mass and entropy are nonlinear functions, and you can see that basically at large mass, then the, the mass goes as the cube, and so the entropy goes as the two-thirds power, which is, what, which is indeed what you'd expect for conformal field theory with two plus one dimensions, one time and two space dimensions. So, <clears throat> The number of quantum states of a black hole of roughly this size is approximately e to the s, and this multiplied by the time for a light to travel a distance comparable to the hole, say that, is a classical recurrence time. It's the expected time to return to near the initial state if the black hole were, uh, say, if you imagine, this is not really full quantum theory, if we're undergoing a sequence of classical transitions. So if we're represented by roughly s classical bits, ignoring factors like log 2, that each could take values of 0, 1. This would be expected time until the black hole returned to the same sequence of qubits. Uh, OK, I'm not, I don't fully understand the arguments, and I'm not sure I can repeat them, but Lenny Susskind and others have argued that black holes formed by collapse from smooth initial conditions remain free of firewalls for a time at least of the order of the classical recurrence time, assuming they're kept from evaporating. And if they did evaporate, then big black holes, they wouldn't last anywhere near this time, so that they would never become unsmooth. But even if they're in, in the center, there are arguments that, they, that they, it won't get, um, again, I'm not completely competent to discuss the details and I don't have time to discuss the details. Now, if you want just, not just the microscopic classical configuration to return to, to near some previous value, but also the quantum state, then you need all the amplitudes for all, well, all to, re to return to very near the same values so that you don't get an orthogonal state. So the sum of the absolute squares of the differences of these amplitudes are small. So this is a much stronger constraint, and it takes a quantum recurrence time, which for black holes is estimated to be doubly exponential. So ex exponentiate the number of, that's the number of states, but you have to have an exponential of that because you're, you're basically having this number of, of, of states with, with phases. You want all, basically, nearly all the phases to come back to be close to zero. So doubly exponential the entropy or in the number of qubits representing the black hole. So, okay, Jose talked a little bit about complexity at the end. 
Uh, Susskind and others, like Adam Brown, have argued that the complexity of a black hole quantum state, which is defined as the minimal number of a certain set of quantum gates needed to produce the state, <coughs> well, within some epsilon that's, again, not specified, uh, <coughs> to produce a state from a simple fiducial state goes linear with the time for a order of this. This is, I think, what Jose called the, 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 the Heisenberg time, the, 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 the classical recurrence time and then it reaches the maximum possible value, and then the complexity stays there with small fluctuations, but then if you want it to have a fluctuation that goes down very near to zero, that takes this quantum recurrence time. So <clears throat> anyway, so he's saying that, well, maybe the black hole stays smooth up until at least this, this, uh, this time, and then it might have firewalls. I mean, okay, nobody's really sure. It might have firewalls, but then occasionally maybe the firewalls would go away if it went down to that. Okay, this is very speculative and I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I tend to favor the fact that it's the, the view that they hardly ever have firewalls, but it's, that's a subject of, of... Okay, let me go back to the, the, the time scales and let's collect the number of them and, and do them for, for two masses for a solar mass, even though that's too small to actually astrophysically form a black hole, but it's a convenient mass unit. And then also for these ones, it's roughly the highest estimate of any supermassive black hole to observe so far. So the shortest one I can think of is the quantum period uh, in Planck units, 2 pi over m, 2 pi over the energy. So in Planck units, it's that. So that many seconds for a solar mass, for a 40 billion solar mass, it's really short. Next shortest time, I can think it might be the time to travel one short shield radius. You might call it the light crossing time. So for a solar mass, that's about 10 to the minus 5 seconds. For supermassive black holes, it's of order of four and a half days for light to go, <coughs> go that distance. <coughs> okay, then, uh, all right, then there's a scrambling time, and, and this is a time for the information to essentially get scrambled over the black hole, or, well, other things that, that uh, Preskill and Hayden show, or Hayden and Preskill showed that uh, if you knew all of the quantum information that came out of the black hole up to some time, and now you've, somebody fed in some new information, how long would it take for you to decode that new information, and that's also of order the scrambling time, so it's the light time, crossing time times the log of s. So then for the, the solar mass black hole, it's, it's, it's about three milliseconds. And for this one, it's of order 5.6 years. So it's bigger than the four and a half days by this log factor. All right, then another scale, again, this is a little arbitrary, but if you, if you ask what sort of anti de Sitter space could have this black hole in it as a microcanonical ensemble, the time scale for the oscillation of, of a particle in this anti de Sitter space, that would give another scale that you, you could <coughs> get. And basically, because it goes the e to the 5 thirds, then th that's about 10 to the 65 Planck units, or about 10 to the 14 years. For a solar mass black hole, that's the, if you, if, if you'd have to have an anti de Sitter space with a, with a length scale or a time scale less than this to hold it. If it was bigger than that, the black, it would be more favorable for the black hole to evaporate away. For this 40 billion mass one, you get 8 times 10 to the 31 years for this. Then this time to reach the maximum von Neumann entropy, uh, that's what some people call the, 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 the page time. Well, maybe they haven't defined it well, so I don't know. Maybe I'm taking liberties with it to say it's the time when the von Neumann is, is the maximum, but I, su I assume that's what people mean. Anyway, I didn't make up the name, so I'm not, I guess I should leave it to who, how they define it. But put, having the peak of the von Neumann entropy, at least if you start, is a reasonable thing. So that time scale for a solar mass black hole is it's 6 times 10 to the 66 years. For the supermassive, it's about 4 times 10 to the 98 years. The Hawking evaporation time is, you know, of order 2 times this, but not quite. Uh, so that's 10 to the 67 years for the solar mass and almost 10 to the 99 years for the, for the, the supermassive black hole. Uh, <clears throat> then these recurrence times, if we have reflecting boundary conditions to prevent the evaporation, the classical recurrence time, uh, because it's a huge exponential, it doesn't really matter whether I use Planck units or the Schwarzschild radius. So here I could basically just give it in Planck, well, whatever units. You multiply this by the Planck or by the Schwarzschild radius. That's going to make some tiny change in the very far number of digits of these, far more digits than I've given. So it's 10 to that or 10 to this for this. So the second one is roughly a Googleplex raised to the power of the fine structure constant, if you want a mnemonic for it. And the quantum recurrence time is, again, exponential of that. So that's of order of this for the solar mass one and, and very this. 
And so it's very nearly, uh, so we have a Google, and then this is a Googleplex. So Googleplex to the alpha power factorial. Then take a factorial of that. It's not quite as big as when my children were younger, they wanted to know a big number. Well, I told them a Googleplex, they want something bigger. So the shortest two-word thing I could say is Googleplex factorial. So they kept going around saying they want a Googleplex factorial of cake or Googleplex factorial. I can't, of course, I can't say it's a Googleplex factorial. You'll have to take a Googleplex to the alpha power and then take a factorial to get this, to, to, to get this number for a 40 billion mass black hole. Okay, so to conclude, Classically, a vacuum spherical black hole is very simple, described by the short shield metric when the cosmological constant is zero, or by the short shield anti desitter metric that I gave back earlier when the, when the cosmological constant is, is negative, and there's an analogous one when the cosmological constant is positive. But a quantum black hole has a complicated behavior at many different time scales. The quantum oscillation time, that, the light crossing time, the scrambling time, the largest ADS period for microcanonical ensemble that's that, the so-called page time, the Hawking decay time, the classical recurrence time, and the quantum recurrence time. So <clears throat> for a supermassive black hole of 40 billion solar masses, these times range from less than 10 to the 91 seconds to very roughly the factorial of the 137th root of a Googleplex. So <clears throat> anyway, okay, so anyway, so black holes are extremely fascinating, and when you go to the, the, the quantum, they become very complex. And there's lots of mysteries about them. We don't yet understand exactly how does the information come out? Are there firewalls? And if so, when? But it's a very fascinating subject to, to consider. So thanks for your attention.